Okay, well, um, so yeah, I'm still working at trying to get those midterm funds back. I'm not there yet, sorry. Um, uh, maybe Monday. Okay. Um, and uh, I also just realized that I never put the Tuesday's lecture up on YouTube yet. So um, I'll do that soon. All right. <laughs> it's been crazy. Um, so the reading for today, unless there's any questions about anything like this. So the reading for today is the three critics of Popper. Um, in some ways, they're really different from each other. Uh, they, uh, they're coming at Popper from a really different point of view. Right, so that um, I'm really confused about what the class of class is. <laughs> okay, but anyway, right, so um and two of them we've seen before, Neurot and Putnam, as critics of uh, Carnap. And then the third one is Imre Lakatosh. So um, Neurot's point of view is uh, basically like Popper is not one of us. Us meaning the Vienna Circle. Um, and uh, and especially at the end of the paper, it becomes clear that that's his point, right? And he's like, uh, notice how he respects the bad old philosophy. <laughs> he doesn't even try to hide it. <laughs> he says metaphysics is okay, <laughs> right? So, um, you know, so although, you know, he admits, well, first of all, that he used certain ideas developed by us. <laughs> and second of all, that maybe we can learn some isolated lessons from him. Basically, the main point is like, you know, be warned, he looks look kind of like one of us, but he isn't. Um, Putnam's uh, tone is, it's also pretty negative, but it's at least Ray, like, he's, first of all, he starts off by saying, well, at least Popper is on the right side of certain fights, the right side being Putnam's side, right? So, um, and in fact, uh, what Neuroth's like biggest charge against Putnam, that he's a metaphysical realist, is uh, Putnam's, is the main reason Putnam likes him. <laughs> so, but, um, but then he goes on to say, nevertheless, in many ways, Popper is no better than those positivists, <laughs> right? So, right, like as opposed to Neurath saying, he looks like one of us good positivists, but he really isn't. Let him just say, uh, uh, although Popper has some good ideas about some things, he's, he's basically still just as bad as a positivist. <laughs> um, and, uh, but in particular, it's, uh, the the content of the criticism well content of the criticism anyway the content of the antagonism is um that proper is just another part of the same old generation and what is the old generation doing well they're involved in these intricate theoretical disputes. And meanwhile, they're completely out of touch with what's actually going on in the world and what might be needed to change it, right? Like that's Putnam's point of view. Um, 
And in fact, Popper is actually even worse because his thought is quote unquote reactionary, right? So that's the that's the part where Putnam says that like uh, you can really see how bad Popper's position is because it's against Marxism. <laughs> So right, so like as I think as I mentioned before, in this period, uh, Putnam was a Maoist. <laughs> when I knew him many years later, he was not. You know, I, I he was still pretty left wing politically. But, but in this, yeah, in this period, he was. Uh, um, but, but I mean, that, that doesn't capture all of it because it's, it's, this is, as I think I mentioned before, in the case of Putnam's relationship with Carnap, this is, it's not, it's not, it's not just about left versus right. It's about like new left versus old left and liberalism, <laughs> right? So that's right. So I think that's why um, Putnam is saying like, you know, really Popper, although he's kind of right, and Carnap, although he's kind of left, are all, they're, they're basically, they're just involved in the same, like, endless worry about theoretical questions and they're never gonna get anything done. That, I mean, uh, again, of course, the topic of the paper is, uh, uh, except for those few places where, uh, uh, you know, explicit political content comes out. The top of the paper is Popper's philosophy of science, not his politics. But, um, well, I mean, it's just an example of what I've been kind of arguing or suggesting throughout the course that these two things are, are closely connected to each other. These people's views of science and their views about society in general. Um, so, um, so therefore, I think the tone of, so I guess I should say one other thing. So this is an old paper by Carter, right? This was, uh, I forget what the original year of this was, but it's um, not long after the original publication of Logic of Scientific Discovery. Yeah, 1935. So the same year that Logic of Scientific Discovery was originally published. These other two from Putnam and Lakatos were published in this volume, um, which I've mentioned before. I mean, I mentioned this series before. It's, right, it's called the Schultz Volumes. The editor of the series is in Schultz. Um, but it's, that's what people call it, but the official title is the Library of Living Philosophers, right? And so what they did was, they, you know, took famous living philosophers and got various people to contribute. Often critical, but at least, you know, essays discussing their position. And then the philosopher would respond. So like the whole second part of the volume is the philosopher responds to his critics. Um, so, uh, so, so that means, it's interesting, we have Popper's responses to Putnam and Locke. Um, and, um, and what I just said helps to explain the tone of Popper's response to Putnam. This is how it starts. So this isn't part of the assigned reading, but it's on page 993 in that volume. I did put it on reserve by Kennedy, if anyone's interested in it. Um, this is how it starts. I enjoyed reading Professor Hillary Putnam's paper because it is crisply and clearly written. But Professor Putnam's conclusions are all wrong. Professor Putnam is a leader of the younger generation of logicians, while I am a tottering old metaphysician. This is perhaps the explanation of why he found it unnecessary to do his homework. <laughs> right? And so like Popper's, or well, actually I'll read one more sentence rather than summarizing it. In general, he has not read, or if read, not understood what I have written. <laughs> Some of which happens to be very similar to, but older than, a very interesting paper of Putnam's to which he refers in his footnote one. 
right? Very similar to, but older than, meaning that kind of didn't read his work and didn't realize that what he was saying in this later paper, Hopper had already said a long time ago. <laughs> so, um, um, so I'm going to come back and talk about whether, like, whether Popper's response to Putnam, you know, beyond those opening chats, what, like, whether it's fair or not. Um, and the same question to be asked about Lakatosh, but first of all, so Lakatosh is like, is and sees himself as a follower of Popper. Right? He begins his. His paper by saying, My debt to him is immeasurable. More than anyone else, he changed my life. <laughs> right? That's so, um, so, so Popper is like Lakatosh's inspiration for everything. And therefore, when he asks this question, so he asks this a little bit farther into the paper on page 245. Um, Under what conditions would you give up your demarcation criteria? Um, this, this question is actually rather poignant coming from Lakatos to Popper, because Lakatos is proposing a revision of Popper's demarcation criteria. And by asking under what circumstances would you give up your demarcation criteria, he's asking Popper, under what circumstances would you like acknowledge me? <laughs> Okay. And Popper's uh, response, so in the case of the response to Putnam, like I said, the tone seems justified. In, replace, in the case of the response to Lakatosh, it seems kind of heartless. And this is, uh, Lakatosh died before the volume was published. So like, I guess he never saw this response. But still, you know, so like Popper says, now that I am called on to reply to his views, I am disturbed to find that the argument which appears to be crucial for his criticism of my views on demarcation must, in my opinion, be rejected as totally unsound. But among his criticisms, he raises points which I would not have expected from one who is well acquainted with my work. And that his examination of my views seems to have left him, and unfortunately, large number of people who have read his papers, with an interpretation of my theory of falsifiability that makes nonsense of all my views, <laughs> right? So that's pretty harsh. Um, so, um, so anyway, like this is all to summarize how, in some ways, how different they are from each other, and uh, um, how different Popper's response maybe should be, although maybe it's not as different as we expect. Um, but um, nevertheless, they have a lot of things in common, and that's what I'm mostly going to discuss, right? So I mean, it's I think it's maybe especially interesting, considering they're coming from very different points of view, that they do settle on common themes about um, what they see as a problem in Popper. Um, now, I mean, I guess I'll just give like a preview to say that I think that <clears throat> they do all like misread Popper in a certain sense. Um, or at least they present him in a way which encourages this misreading. Um, so, you know, if you're going to criticize someone, you would you would think you should kind of build them up as much as possible, give them all their defenses before you criticize them. But it seems like these people, and I think it's maybe a common response to Popper somehow, is to kind of like wave away all the subtleties or complexities of his defense and just like take a simple version of it and criticize that. 
Um, I mean, proper proper complains that that's what people do to him, and, but I think there's there's a lot of truth to that. Um, however, on the other hand, I have to say that proper's responses or um, potential responses, as far as I know, proper did not respond directly to North, even though he had many years to do that if he wanted to. Um, the proper's responses also involve misreadings of that, <laughs> right? So, uh, like. Or in summary, I guess I would say there really are some serious issues that these people are raising, but uh, they're misinterpret, they're misreading or, or mistreating of proper actually like doesn't help them. It helps to it, it obscures the issues that they're raising. Um, and uh, um, and it makes it easier for proper not to notice them and just to, like. Just be indignant that you've been misinterpreted. Okay, so what are the things that they all say about Popper? Well, so first of all, they all complain that he wants too much logical purity or like he wants clean distinctions, um, definite decisions in advance of what a theory says. And um, By the way, they all charge Carnap with the same thing, right? So, so far, we're not talking about a, a criticism that's specific to Popper. Again, like, I think it's most explicit in Putnam saying, like, that's the problem with this whole generation. Um, they're, they're ideologues, right? They're living in this space of, uh, um, Clean logical distinctions, and they don't realize that really what really matters is concrete decisions about what to do in the world. Um, but uh, you know, Neurath also, even though um, he thinks Carnap is one of us, <laughs> right? So when he writes against Popper, he says like. We think of science more like this and more like this, and Popper doesn't. And he's like implicitly including Carnap in that. And we saw previously when he criticized Carnap, he pretty much criticized the exact same thing. He just he just put it differently, right? Like when he was criticizing Carnap, it was in terms of, um, you know, unfortunately, some even among the Vienna circle have completely managed to get rid of the traces of old metaphysical <laughs> theories. And but I'm sure we'll soon get over this and we'll continue with our common project. Right? So um, so when he talks when he says the same thing about Popper, he's like, oh, you can see he's you know no good because he's still. But um, but 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 the truth is he you know he does basically charge. Carnap and Popper both with um, thinking in terms of uh, like ideal, clean, logical, axiomatized systems when what's really going on is something much messier. In this paper, he calls it encyclopedias, right? Like, so there's, there's just like a whole kind of repository of things people have said and it's loosely connected. And things get added or deleted from the encyclopedia, and uh, it's never clear if it's entirely consistent. Um, and you have to choose between encyclopedias. So, uh, like, just because one of them has something bad in it doesn't mean that you're not gonna choose it because the other ones may be worse. <laughs> um, so. Um, And uh, Lakatos doesn't mention Carnap by name, but he says that both the inductivist and Popper have, have missed, have failed to notice certain things in common. Um, and I think this is this is one of them that again we're not dealing. It's really all three of them say this in different ways. We're not dealing with isolated, clean theories where you can see exactly what the content of the theory is. We're dealing with Neurath calls them encyclopedias, Lakatos calls them research programs. But it's the same type of idea, right? There's like a loose body of work that hangs together certain ways. There are core parts of it that we don't want to give up, but then like 
on the outer parts, we have to decide which things we want to replace with what, depending on what protocol sentences get accepted or what observations get made. Um, and I think uh, they all emphasize that somehow that vagueness is essential to the progress of science, the way they understand it. So, right, so that the, the problem isn't just that it's that because, uh, like, if, if you say, well, you know, the view of science you're working with is overly idealized. So, obviously, the response to that could be, um, well, you know, just like in physics, we consider ideal systems in order to understand what's going on. You know, so we think about, uh, you know, a cylinder rolling on a frictionless plane, or you know, yeah, like, um, so uh, yeah, we're ignoring some of the messiness that goes that, that goes on in the real practice of science because we're trying to isolate the principles that are involved. But what I think uh, all three of these people are saying against Hopper is that. Um, if you leave out that messiness, you're leaving out the real explanation of why science makes progress or part of it. So, I mean, if that's true, obviously that's that that's a major criticism of Popper. As I keep pointing out the whole point of doing anything like this is to try to explain why it is that modern science seems to make this kind of progress. So. Um, um, and the way this works is it, that um, science makes progress by not keeping careful track of the meaning of its terms. That's again what they all claim. So Neurot says this most explicitly. This is on page 129. Just the continuity of formulations, however, plays a great part in the selection of model encyclopedias. Such continuity rests in part on constant use of quaternio terminorum. So quaternio terminorum. <laughs> is a fancy name for the fallacy of equivocation, right? It means like a syllogism is supposed to have three terms. So It's supposed to have three terms. It has a middle term that's repeated twice, and it helps you helps to connect the other two terms in the conclusion. So suppose you use the a word to mean one thing here and use the same word to mean something else there, then it will look like a valid syllogism, but it really won't be. Right, so that's called the, the you know the fallacy of four terms because it means that although it looks like there's three terms, there's really four. Um, so Nora is saying Nora says such continuity rests in part on constant use of quaternio terminorum. What he means is that as you go along and the encyclopedia develops, it seems like we're still talking about the same thing. But the meaning of the terms has shifted. Um, I mean, that is, I, he doesn't literally mean that there's little syllogisms, right? I mean, no one really, actually, no one really uses syllogisms. People who believe in syllogisms didn't use them very much. But he's just, like I said, he's really just using that as a fancy way of saying equivocation. It works based on equivocation. Um, 
right? And he says, um, so in contrast with purity, this makes possible a connection from people to people, from age to age, from scientist to scientist. Right, so he's saying that part of what makes scientific progress possible is that like um, we can keep this discussion about electrons going, even though like what we mean by electrons um, may really have changed pretty radically in between. Right? Like, like we used to think of an electron as a little ball with a negative charge. And, you know, when you make the transition to quantum mechanics or, or even more to, you know, to um, quantum field theory, you, you realize that an electron isn't really a little ball with a negative charge. But you can still keep using the word electron. And you can still keep using even like the symbols for electron, right? And so the, like the old formulas are still true. Um, and that allows the, the discussion to continue. Um, um, again, even though, even though our ideas about what the world is like have changed drastically. And I mean, I think, you know, it's true. And sometimes uh, I don't know if Nora or Lakatosh or Putnam explain very well how this works. I mean, it's, it happens sometimes in a way that's almost, that's mysterious. Like, it, I mean, it's not just the word electron, like in the transition from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics. Um, You get this identification between things that used to be, I don't know if I can explain this well enough, <laughs> but you get this identification between things that used to be variables that stand for numbers to using the same variable to stand for like an operator that operates on the wave function. So, you know, if, like, um, No, I don't think I. But it's like, you know, if you had a equation that says that the energy is equal to um, the energy squared is equal to the momentum squared over the mass. So, you know, um, this is like a classical equation. And then you like generate the quantum mechanical equivalent by taking E no longer to stand for a number, but now to stand for like an operator that operates on the wave function. It's the, the, with respect to time or something. I'm, I'm, not, I'm kind of messing this up. I don't know. But yeah, I guess I can't really explain the details of it, especially because I don't remember them very well. But <laughs> what I'm trying to say is like the same formula will continue to be true, even though the letters now stand for something completely different. <laughs> And like a whole transition from one theory to another can be made by that by those means. And it's weird because you would think that like if the letters now stand for something completely different, it's just two different theories. That why like why should it make a difference that you can use the same letters? <laughs> but somehow it seems like it does help. Yeah. Um, I know how like I think last class you were saying. Like the inductivist would say with Popper, you know, you're just making these guesses um, one after the other, how many further can you? And but really, like the guesses are connected, like one theory, like um, Newtonian mechanics, like when you give up on that and take, come up with a new guess, how it could be like Newtonian mechanics still works within a smaller, like, domain. Yes. 
Maybe I was gonna say, but could that like same uh, like mechanism be used to change like the meaning of terms? Like uh, like that doing that same thing on like a small level? Yeah, I think I mean so. Uh, Um, well, I might, you know, I guess you might turn it around the other way and say, like, the function of this continuity is to keep us from just making random guesses. And it doesn't matter that much. It would be one way of going at it. It doesn't matter that much, or, or even like the way Popper thinks that happens. It's not right. The way we actually do it. This is what you can see Neurod has said. When we actually keep from just making random guesses one after another is by this kind of, from some point of view, arbitrary constraint of we have to still be able to use the same words to say, right? So like, um, you know, like we want to say momentum is conserved. And if the thing we used to call momentum we can't say momentum is conserved. Well, we have to change the word momentum in such a way that it means something that is conserved. <laughs> um, that would be more like, I mean, I guess you could see that with the momentum on greater and quantum mechanics, but like that would be more like, uh, you know, a transition from Newtonian mechanics to relativity, where it's still like at least special relativity. General relativity is a little weird, but. Like where it's still like the same quantities are conserved, quote unquote, but they're but but they're not what you thought they were. <laughs> so um, yeah, I I think at least maybe that's a way to understand how, what Moira thinks about it. Whether that's really the explanation for why this works, I'm not sure. Um, so um and I think Lakatos is making a similar point when he talks about quote unquote problem shifts, right? So Lakatos, you know, this is Lakatos's terminology, and we're not reading enough of it to really get into it. But you know, he has research programs, and then within research programs, there are what he calls problem shifts. So a problem shift basically means that like you change the question that's being asked in the research program, which is, I mean, which again is like is is like shifting the definition of your terms from one thing to another. It's right. It's like it because uh, a question. Basically, like when you ask whether it's a good question, you're you're asking whether it's phrased in proper terms. So um, if you kind of like if you continue asking the old question, but the problem has actually shifted, that's basically equivalent to changing what your terms mean. So um, so I and I, I think Lakatosh's view also is that this is essential to how research programs progress. I mean, there's, there's more complication to it. You know, there's, there's what he calls progressive shifts versus regressive shifts, right? Like, so if the, if the research program is flowering, the, the, the shifts are always fruitful, whereas if it's kind of on the way out and the shifts somehow are like, making it less and less interesting. Um, but there's one way or the other, it's always going to be shifts. Yeah. Is this kind of like related to that like conversation we had like a long time ago about like, like theories of like reference, you know, like if I say Professor Stone is is the person who has like a beard, you know, and shave it all off, you know, am I sort of the same person? I guess. Is that kind of related to it? How like I have to alter the properties I cast Professor Stone while the Professor Stone has a uh, Sort of reference is uh, is retained you know, across sentences, or I, I guess uh, you know like is this like like a new Lorax re respond to kind of like I guess quite a few of like Russell's um, like kind of Russell's uh, uh, theory of reference. I mean like for for Carnap, you know like if, if you have a, a term in different ways and just include that and have different thoughts for each one. Yeah. So uh, I guess is this like Lorax response to, to those two 
and there's like kind of necessity of tying reference to a real property of, of, of that that's being referred or, or whatnot. See, I mean, that's not the way Neurot, they, I mean, we've seen Neurot, it's like the one thing Neurot and Carnap definitely agree about is that the question about like, what are the real properties of something is nonsense, <laughs> right? So um, that is the way Putnam, I think, understands the exact same phenomenon. So like there's another famous paper by Putnam called The Meaning of Meaning, <laughs> the meaning of, the second meaning is in quotes in the title, right? The meaning of meaning. <laughs> and uh, and he, uh, yeah, talks about these cases where, um, um, so they, you know, one famous case is the so-called twin earth example. So the, tw the twin earth example is, they, like there's another planet somewhere that's exactly like the, the Earth, only the role that's filled by H2O on Earth is filled by a different molecule on the other X, Y, Z. So, um, and H2O and X, Y, Z are like difficult to distinguish chemically, but not impossible. That's, that's an important part of the example. So like, up until a certain point in the history of Earth and twin Earths, um, it's this, I mean, it's already getting weird how to describe this, but like experiments all have the same results, <laughs> right? Because chemistry hasn't advanced enough to make the distinction between H2O and XYZ. Um, and now, the question is, so if the people on Earth invent this word water and they use it to mean H2O, um, does it mean H2O rather than XYZ? And Putnam's answer is yes, right? It means H2O, it doesn't mean XYZ. So like if, if, if they invented this word before they were able to tell the difference between H2O and XYZ, the reason it means H2O and not, not XYZ can't be anything that they know, right? So like the slogan here is meaning is not in the head. Well, meaning ain't in the head, I guess. <laughs> right, but what, what determines what your word means is like partly what the world is actually like around you. When these people are in this, might say in causal contact with H2O and not with XYZ. And that explains why they mean H2O and not XYZ, even though they can't tell the difference. Now, I mean, there's a lot of things to say about this. First of all, XYZ is impossible, like physically impossible. <laughs> okay, I mean, there's no other molecule that does what, what H2O does, but, um, but uh, which is, probably far from irrelevant actually. And you know, if you think about the other ancient elements like air and earth and fire, like what did those turn out to mean? Well, you know, like if if the air on this planet is made of different molecules than the air on Earth, is it air? I guess so, right? I mean the air turned out not to be the name of a kind of molecule at all. <laughs> but so I don't know. Anyway, there's a lot of things to ask about this example, but um, but yeah, this is one of the examples that Putnam uses to try to show that what determines what our words mean is the real properties that things actually have. So um, so uh, but I mean, he uses that to explain, I think, the same feature where like. You know, um, so as time goes on, like before a certain point, we didn't know that water referred to H2O. And that's so, like, in some sense, that's not what we meant by it. Um, it's not what we thought we meant by it, I guess, at least you could say. And then once we discover what it is, now, um, like, 
when we say, you know, there's water in this glass, it's like the content of what we're thinking is different from the content of, of a previous person. So in some sense, the word has shifted its meaning, but Putnam says that's not what we call shifted meaning. I guess I think you probably saw that also in the, the Putnam paper about Carnot, he makes some reference to that. So, um, so, and again, that's part of how science is able to progress. They were able to keep using the same words, even though the content we associate with them keeps changing. It's just, I mean, he like Neurot wants to say the meaning of the word actually changes. Putnam wants to say, no, the meaning of the word doesn't change, and that's what allows us to do it. But I think like the underlying phenomenon they're talking about is the same thing. That we keep using the same word, even though we we completely change our beliefs about the thing we're talking about. Um, yeah, does, does that help like explain how it is or it's not connected to definite description? Yeah. Um, so um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing, which I think in all of their minds is at least partly connected with this, is that we don't abandon theories just because of what Neurot calls shaking. I should have written down what this was. This, is, this paper is also translated from German, obviously. I forget what. Translating shaking. I'm not going to figure it out now. So anyway, right, Nora takes like uses this as an alternative to falsification. In the same way, he says that Popper wants to use corroboration as an alternative to verification. He says, you know, so what happens when we when we find a result that seems inconsistent and we don't know how to fit it into our encyclopedia is that. Um, we have a problem, but um, uh, but this problem probably won't result in us throwing out the whole encyclopedia. So it's like shaken. It's a problem for it, but the uh, popper is taking an overly simplified view of what scientific what the scientific enterprise is like to think that we have this theory that's, you know, just waiting for the test that's going to make us throw it out. <laughs> so the reason I say, like, um, and this is the same thing that Button talks about, partly he's taking this word from Kuhn, and we're reading Kuhn next, but, um, but Putnam, I think, use, like uses stuff and takes from Kuhn, but is like doesn't really understand the depth of what Kuhn is doing. <laughs> so, but, so that that's why you know we're spending more time on Kuhn than on Putnam. I'm going to read that last, but um, but yeah. So anomalies um, is is Kuhn's term for the same type of thing. Like observations that our current um, encyclopedia or research program, or I guess again using Kuhn's terminology, uh, this is something like what Putnam is calling a paradigm. Um, we have some observations that our current research program or encyclopedia or paradigm doesn't quite know how to assimilate. And what do we do with them? Well, we like mark them as anomalies, things that are unexplained. And then we try to figure out how we could explain them, or we decide maybe they're too hard and we leave them over to be dealt with later. Um, um, so, um, so an important example of this that Neurath and Putnam both discuss is the precession of the orbit of Mercury. 
Um, so, um, I guess, well, before I go on to the example, I should say, how is this related to the other point? Well, it, it's, it's somehow related to it because I guess the idea is that if you were perfectly clear about what your theory predicted, Popper would be right. You would have to give it up if its predictions fail. But since what you're really dealing with is this kind of loose, vague system where like, it's part of the normal progress of science to change the meanings of the terms, to like, um, you know, uh, adjust some parts over here to make this part work better and so on and so forth. That like, in other words, what Popper is, would call ad hoc stratagems or conventionalist stratagems are actually part of the normal progress of science. Um, and that's, you know, and so that's at least part of why science is able to deal with anomalies or shaking the way it does. So this is, so the example of the precession of the perihelion of mercury is did, wait, I didn't discuss this before in this class, did I? No, okay. So, you know, I mean, so in Newtonian mechanics, if you have two point masses, and um, then they both go around the center of mass on conic sections. So, like, for example, ellipses. And of course, if one of them is much more massive than the other, then the center of mass would be right here. So you can really think of this one going around this one, say, on an ellipse. And um, it will just keep doing that forever. If there are no other bodies, and if these are point masses, and there's no other forces, right? This is a closed figure, and it will just keep going on this ellipse forever. Um, however, uh, if there's other masses, you know, I did talk about this before when I talked about the discovery of Neptune. If there's other masses in the system, like Jupiter over here, then, you know, then it might no longer be the case that, then it will no longer be the case that the orbit is just a conic section exactly. So there'll be what's called perturbations. And one of the kind of perturbations is that, right, so like, um, if this is the major axis of the ellipse, we call, like, if, and if, if, if this body here is the sun, we call this the perihelion and this the aphelion, right? So like the point where it comes closest to the sun is called the perihelion. So if, again, if there were no other bodies and so forth, this would always be, this line would always point in the same direction and this point would always stick right there. But one of the perturbations you can get is that you know, every time it comes back, it comes back, you know, not quite to the same place in such a way that the perihelion moves around over time, right? So that like the orbit really is kind of you know like that. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't quite manage to close back on itself. So like I said, that can be explained, you know, and so like I think all the planets have some precession of the perihelion and, it, and, and you know, it was one of the things that Newton and his successors did was to explain perturbations like that by, by putting back in the other masses and seeing what they do. But there was a, um, when they did that for Mercury, they were only able to explain part of it. So there's like an anomalous procession of the perihelion of Mercury that, that no one can figure out how to explain. So, I mean, uh, and this like went on for a long time, <laughs> like centuries, right? So, you know, everyone knew, or I mean, most people didn't care, right? But everyone who was interested knew that there was this anomalous procession of the perihelion of Mercury, cause unknown. 
I mean, certain explanations were proposed, right? At some point, it was proposed that there was another planet, which they wanted to call Vulcan, closer to the sun than Mercury, that might explain this, but there is no planet there. Yeah. So, uh, so, and see, what's important about this is it's not a stray observation, as Popper would say. It's a replicable falsifying hypothesis. I mean, it's not a universal law, right? It's, it's not saying everywhere in the universe where such conditions occur, there'll be this anomalous procession. But remember, Popper says the falsifying hypothesis that itself doesn't have to have strict universality, right? It could be something like there's a family of white ravens living in the zoo in New York. So this is certainly at least as good as that, right? Saying, you know, you can watch this year after year, and it keeps doing the same thing. So according to Popper, it seems like they should have gotten rid of the theory as falsified, right? I mean, they should have said, okay, Newtonian mechanics is falsified. Or maybe they would have been justified in adopting some ad hoc hypothesis to explain it. There's other non-gravitational forces at work, you know, something like that. They didn't do that either, right? So Popper says, like, sometimes you can be justified in doing that. I mean, part of the question, and I think part of Lagatosh's difficulty interpreting Popper is, like, comes down to, does Popper ever think you can do that just to put off having to reject the theory, even though it's falsified? Sometimes it sounds like it does, and sometimes it sounds like it doesn't. But anyway, in this case, they didn't even do that, right? They just said, oh, I don't know, who knows why there's that procession, and they went on to work on other stuff. So then, you know, it turns out that general relativity explains that anomalous procession, <laughs> right? I mean, you only see it in the case of Mercury, because Mercury is the closest planet to the sun, and the gravitational field of the sun is strong there. Um, and so, you know, there's a, there's a small relativistic correction, and it's enough to explain exactly the, the observed anomaly. So, like, once general relativity was on the table, suddenly this became a crucial experiment, so to speak. Right? Like, now all of a sudden we see, oh, this is how you can tell that the quantum mechanics is wrong and general relativity is right. Look, at general relativity can predict this. But before general relativity on the table was on the table, no one thought that this was a reason to give up the quantum mechanics. Right? So, so as I said, Neuron and Putnam both mentioned this, and I think they both mentioned it because it, it really seems like a problem for for Popper to explain this. It doesn't seem like, and, and, and it, it seems like scientists did the right thing throughout this process. Also, that's also important, right? Like in retrospect, it doesn't seem like they should have just given up Newtonian mechanics as soon as they discovered this. That wouldn't have led to progress. Newtonian mechanics worked really well, and general relativity probably never would have been discovered if it had just been thrown out. They just, if people just said, well, who knows why the connection is there, right? So, um, so, uh, so it seems like they really did the right thing to shelve this anomaly as too hard to account for now until the time came when there was a, like, um, a new research program or a new encyclopedia or whatever that was able to assimilate this and build something on it. Um, so, um, So they conclude, all of them, I think, conclude that from this, well, we abandon an old research program only when we have a better alternative. And even then, we don't do it quickly. We don't do it hastily. 
Um, there aren't really crucial experiments because what looks in retrospect like a crucial experiment at the time just looked like an anomaly. And that this is gen a general feature of the progress of science. And that it's a like necessary feature of the progress of science. Right? That it's not just an unfortunate, like, right? Because again, like Popper can Popper knows perfectly well that scientists don't always follow the rules that he's setting up. Um, but, uh, and that's fine, right? Because he says, I'm not a naturalist. I'm not describing the way science is as a part of the natural world. I'm giving up, making a proposal to what the rules of science should be. But he's, um, but he's making that proposal with the idea that if you take science to be that, you'll understand why science is so successful. If it turns out that science, that the, that the overall success of science has been due to not following his rules, then, you know, he can still propose those rules, but there's no point to them. <laughs> right. So, um, so this seems like a really difficult thing for Popper to account for. Um, Now, in his in his response, so I guess this is in response to Putnam, page ninety-four. In his response, Popper says, among other things, you have to conjecture when to stop defending a favorite theory and when to try a new one. I mean, like the first thing he says is, um, I never claim that you just falsify a theory every time you have a falsifying observation. And that's true, as we've seen, for sure, right? So, and, and I think all three of these people, um, even Lakatosh, who is the most careful about interpreting Popper, I think all three of them at least sometimes make it sound like that's Popper's view, right? Like, so as soon as, you have one observation that your theory can't account for, the theory is gone. But we, you know, so um, that definitely is not Popper's position. And so Popper's first response to this type of criticism is to say, well, you, you know, you haven't read my work, you haven't understood what I'm saying, I never said. <laughs> it's, and that, that's all true, but it's not exactly a sufficient response because as I pointed out, this, this looks like it is a falsifying hypothesis. So the one thing that Popper says that, that you know, might be partly a response, we ex explain his response to something like this is, as I was reading before, you have to conjecture when to stop defending a favorite theory and when to try a new one. Right, so that's, and he claims that that was always his position, and it was even his position in the logic of scientific discovery, and he made it clear there. He doesn't give a page number, <laughs> unfortunately. So I don't, you know, I mean, from what I can see, it's uh, difficult to get that view out of the logic of scientific discovery. I think this, this is something like the Lakatos talks about Popper 1 and Popper 2. Um, I think this is something like Lakatos is Popper 2, right? Where Popper 2 is the sophisticated falsifications, as Lakatos puts it. And, uh, right, like Lakatos mentions Popper 1 and Popper 2 because he's trying to decide which one is Popper. <laughs> so, so, um, so this reply suggests something like um, it suggests something like this, like the falsification of a theory is something we can describe logically what the situation that, that can be counted as falsification of a theory is. But the rejection of the theory is something the scientific community has to decide on. Right, it's like a political decision, basically. So, um, 
So uh, they have to decide whether um, this falsifying hypothesis is is sufficiently worrying that it's worth throwing out all the investment in this theory and starting all over. And um, and then if you ask Popper, well, how do, how can they tell? So I mean, I'm not trying to say. This is a this is a defense Popper could mount against this type of criticism because this type of criticism basically points to well they they don't really confront this decision right like they just keep going with their research program and hope it works out and as things are look like things that you might consider to be potential falsifiers they just don't even look at that way. So for Popper to defend his his view, he has to say something like, "No, of course they know that those are potential falsifiers, but they deliberately decide to ignore them for now." And how? And so then, if you ask Popper, "Well, wait, on what basis do they decide?" I mean, logically speaking, this is a falsifier. So Popper says, "Well, you have to guess." <laughs> the same thing he always says. <laughs> Right. That, so, so in other words, his explanation for this would be that it was like, yeah, it was risky to keep using Newtonian mechanics with this unexplained anomaly, and uh, there was no justification to keep doing it. But there's never a justification, <laughs> right? I mean, so it's like you know, uh, at your own risk. Yeah, you could keep defending the old theory if it seems like a good bet. So, I mean, so, so that would be kind of coherent, and I think it's pretty much what Lakatos means by Popper, too. The only question is, like I said, whether, whether he really says that in the logic of scientific discovery. It doesn't sound that way to me. So, I think he may be like, as I think I said before, at least once, that philosophers are not necessarily the best interpreters of their own previous work. Or at least, well, not the best interpreters if what you want is like literal, ac literal accuracy, <laughs> right? Because they're, because they're interpreting their own previous work uh, to try to make sense of it in terms of their current views. Just like the same way they would be interpreting some other philosophers, you know, historical philosophers work. And so they're, you know, so that may be what's going on here. Anyway, um, 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 so that's, uh, so that's, I guess maybe I should have made a list of these, but there's like two things so far. One is they all say that Copper thinks of theories in too clean, logically clean, and idealized a way. Number two is they say that um, Popper thinks that um, if if science worked the way Copper said it does. We would we would see people giving up on science, big established scientific theories because of unexplained anomalies of the kind that basically there always are. <laughs> those and those would all turn out to be crucial experiments, but in fact, you know, there are no crucial experiments. There's just anomalies, unless perhaps, right? I think. I think it's Putnam who says this. There's no crucial experiments unless perhaps after the fact, right? Like looking back, you can see it as a crucial experiment. So that's number two. Number three, they all say that Popper ignores the fact that scientific theories. So I'm, I'm torn between putting it the way some of them put it and the way that would be better to put it. <laughs> so, like, so, so for example, what Putnam says is 
Scientific theories don't explain any basic, don't imply any basic statements, right? So like Newtonian mechanics doesn't imply any uh, actual observations. So like, right? So for example, Newtonian mechanics doesn't imply that the path of the Earth around the Sun should be an ellipse. Um, it only implies that if you add all kinds of other assumptions. So, um, you know, you have to add the assumption that there are no other bodies, that there are no other forces. Putnam also adds, you have to add the assumption that the Earth is moving through a hard vacuum. But I think that's just part of assuming there's no other forces. <laughs> I mean, if it weren't a vacuum, that would be relevant because there would be other forces. So, yeah, you have to assume there's no other bodies, there's no other forces. He doesn't mention this, but you also have to assume, like I said, that the Earth and the Sun are point masses, right? Because otherwise, if they're not point masses, then there's tidal effects. And the orbit won't just keep going. Um, right? Like, because the. Actually, I knew someone who. We tried, really tried to look into this question once, whether the moon is getting farther away from the Earth as time goes on or getting closer. And they concluded that it's really hard to tell over the long term because a lot of the change in the moon's orbit right now is explained by the tides in the Bay of Fundy. <laughs> right, there's like this one place where there's like a resonance between um, the, I guess like the 24 hour period of the Earth's rotation and the, um, the uh, like um, period with which water sloshes back and forth in this particular bay. And it leads to these really huge tides. <laughs> and those really huge tides. So, right, so what happens is that like this, the pump of water gets lifted up and then squashed down. And, um, um, and in the process, like some of the energy um, that was, um, some of the kinetic energy of the Earth in orbit around the common center of mass gets changed into like heat or whatever, right? Due to the friction of this thing being pushed up and down. So, like, um, so it changes the shape of the orbit. I don't think I explained that very well. <laughs> but in any case, right, so you have to assume that they're, you have to assume that they're point masses. Okay, so, um, so Putnam says without these other assumptions, you can't get any, out any predictions at all. And since you can't get any predictions at all, the theory can't be possible. Now, I mean, um, put that way, it's completely unfair as a criticism of Plato. And that's this is one of the places where Popper has in mind when he says that Putnam evidently hasn't read my works, or if he hasn't read them, he hasn't understood them, right? Because does Popper say that you can derive predictions from uh, universal theory? No, <laughs> right? He says you never can derive basic statements from universal theory. The universal theory always looks like this, and you know, the singular statements you can derive from it look like this. And this is not an observable state of affairs, right? Because this says, like, either at the point A, um, either there's something B, or there isn't something A. <laughs> and so, uh, um, since the theory doesn't predict that there's something A anywhere, it doesn't predict anything you can observe anywhere. Right, like with all swans are white, since the theory doesn't predict that there are any swans anywhere, 
It doesn't predict that there's something white anywhere. So, um, so the theory um, only predicts things given initial conditions. But Popper says, although it doesn't predict any basic statements, it does forbid certain basic statements. And that's what makes falsification possible. So like this is Popper's whole point, basically. Right, but it forbids, you know, this. Like, there is this one in A, or sorry, it forbids this. There is this one in A, and it's not white. So, if you find a swan somewhere that's not white, the theory is false. Or, anyway, this is a potential falsifier, right? I mean, um, so, so, like Putnam um, is stating what Popper thinks about this example completely ignores all of this, right? He just says Popper wants us to think that the theory makes these predictions, and if they don't come out, the theory will be falsified. But actually, the theory doesn't make any predictions without these other assumptions, and so it won't work. But Popper all along said the theory wouldn't make predictions without other assumptions. So, um, and that's what Popper says when he replies to him. Um, but, um, but, so the problem is that, um, these other assumptions that you have to make are not mostly the kind of things that Putnam, that uh, Popper calls initial conditions. Um, and I guess, like, for two different reasons. Like, for one thing, some of them are clearly false. I mean, the Earth and the Sun are not point masses. So, and there are other bodies in the universe other than the Earth and the Sun. Um, and, you know, uh, interplanetary space is not a perfect vacuum. Right? So, so there are other forces. Um, I mean, you can see those other forces and you see an aurora, right? You know, like, that means the Earth is traveling through the sun's magnetic field and all kinds of stuff, right? So, I mean, there's definitely other forces. Um, so, those assumptions are false. Well, Putnam says, um, Putnam himself says, well, maybe they could be rephrased in a way where they wouldn't be false, right? Like, instead of saying the Earth and the sun are point masses, we say, you know, their radius is very small compared to the um, radius of the Earth's orbit. And instead of saying there are no other bodies, we say the influence of the other bodies is negligible compared to the influence of the sun, right? And so on and so forth. And then you could, and then the conclusion you would reach would be not the Earth's path is a perfect ellipse, but it's an ellipse to some approximation, right? So, I mean, although Putnam points out, no one ever bothered to do that. Right? Like, no one ever bothered to figure out exactly what the true assumptions that you need. Like, you know, I mean, Newton just starts calculating this without even stating his assumptions. That makes sense. He <laughs> just kind of like, uh, um, just start showing how two point masses would orbit each other in a vacuum. <laughs> and then says, you know, and, you know, here's, you can predict. What orbits will look like. <laughs> so, um, but you know, but and, and even afterwards, people never bothered to figure out exactly, um, like how to rephrase these assumptions to make them true. But so, I mean, that's a little confusing. How that. Um, I mean, in a way, they did do that, right? But just not directly that way, but by calculating perturbations, 
you know, that is, they, they, they like gradually take into account the ways in which the assumptions are not exactly true to get a better and better prediction from the order. But I think, I mean, what's, what's worse about these, and the worst one is the assumption that, well, I mean, I guess too, the, the assumption that there are no other bodies and there are no other forces, those aren't observable states of affairs, right? There are no other bodies in the universe other than the Earth and the Sun. That's not something you can observe. It's like Popper would say it's metaphysical. Right? Like a theory, there is no small. <laughs> you can keep looking forever and you never be, there's, there still could be a swan in the next place you look. Right? So, um, and there are no other forces, is even worse, right? Like, in the sense you can't observe even one force. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, So the point that Putnam could make but fails to make is that um, these, what he calls auxiliary statements, uh, that you need to derive predictions um, um, Do you need to derive predictions that could be used to test the theory? Are just aren't the kind of things that Popper calls initial conditions. Rather, they are themselves like they're not strict universals, but they're themselves some kind of universal hypothesis. And moreover, um, they're we're much less certain about them than we are about the theory. That's, that's Putnam's point number two. So, um, so you can't falsify the theory except by using this, these other assumptions, but the other assumptions we're really not sure are right. In fact, sometimes we're sure they're wrong. <laughs> And again, yeah, maybe we could phrase them more carefully, but we don't bother to. <laughs> so, so what's the point of that? So, like, you know, if if you try to do this is what Putnam calls schema one, you say, you know, like schema one is theory. Auxiliary statements. And you get predictions. Um, so this is the schema you could use for testing the theory, or for that matter, for justifying the theory if you're an inductivist. And Putnam says, either way, this isn't really going to work because. Um, Well, actually, you know, maybe he says this is the worst problem for Popper. It's not going to work for falsifying the theory. Why? So suppose these predictions don't come out, right? It predicts certain things about the movement of the planets, and they don't move that way. So um, does that show that the theory was wrong? Well, no, it shows that the theory plus the auxiliary statements was wrong. But the auxiliary statements are much less certain than the theory, and in fact, they're probably false. <laughs> so when this happens, what are you going to do? Change the auxiliary statements. Right, like that would be the rational thing to do. Because you're really pretty sure this theory is true. It means you just made up to try to make the calculation easier. So when it doesn't come out right, you're going to say, oh, well, I guess I got those auxiliary statements. Um, so Popper, I mean, Popper says, therefore, um, the truth is, 
a lot of times scientists are doing something completely different than this. This is what he calls schema two. And he writes it this way. Now, I've long wondered if there's any connection between this paper and the underwear gnomes meme from South Park, but you guys are probably too bad to know. You know the thing like a question mark, question mark, question mark, profit? Yes. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so anyway, like yeah, I guess it's conceivable that there really is a connection. I mean, some of the South Park creators went to Harvard or Kevin was teaching. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> well, he does make. So, um, so schema two is you have a theory and you have some observations, and your problem is to find out find out some auxiliary statements that will get the explain the observations. And Putnam says scientists are mostly doing this. So the, the theory, so the observations don't fill the role of of either of potential justifiers or of potential falsifiers of the theory. Rather, the observations are what I'm trying to use the theory to explain. And if I can't find good auxiliary hypotheses here, well, I should look hard. <laughs> um, so like he connects this to what Kuhn calls the puzzle solving nature of normal science. Um, I mean, you can see how this looks like kind of a puzzle, right? Like we're trying to, to, to find, as Putnam puts it, the piece that will go into this hole. I, I think when we get to Kuhn, we'll see that Kuhn just thinks that normal science is puzzle solving in a somewhat deeper sense than, than just that. Um, but anyway, but this is how this is how Putnam understands it. It's so um, Right, and the example he uses for this is an example that I know I have already discussed before, which is the discovery of Neptune. Right, so like in that case, we find that the orbit of Uranus doesn't behave the way we expect to, even when we figure in all the perturbations of the other planets. So do we say, and again, it looks like a falsifying hypothesis. So do we say, oh, Newtonian mechanics is falsified? No, we say, Let's see what auxiliary hypotheses might, might explain this. We look for the right ones. And, you know, so these two theorists who worked on it both independently came up with the same auxiliary hypotheses. Auxiliary statements, I mean, so the auxiliary statement is there's another planet in the solar system and this is its orbit and this is where it is. Yeah. And this, like, like makes sense to argue that like, you know, any theory can be true if you have the right auxiliary statements. You know, if I say like you know all swans are black, if you only include swans in this area, or if you only use the word black a certain way, like if you like how far can you extend this? Well, that's so. I mean, that's going to be part of the issue between Putnam and Popper. I think when I talk about Popper's response in a second, um, Putnam is making it sound like you can always find those auxiliary hypotheses. Or like it's reasonable to think you might always be able to find them. So if you can't find, if you haven't found them yet, you should keep looking for them, right? So, um, um, I mean, in some sense, that's right. You know, like even if we observed that the orbit of Uranus was a square, <laughs> so by introducing the right auxiliary statements. You could explain that with Newtonian mechanics, but it would involve, you know, like really weird auxiliary statements that no one believes in. <laughs> yeah. Like, could you argue that there's like a, a normative field of like missable auxiliary statements to a certain degree of freedom? But um, it's like, you know, some auxiliary statements that it's okay to make, and the more absurd ones make up kind of a normative sphere enters the realm of absurdity. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I mean, Popper's not going to say it's the realm of absurdity, but it's the realm of like ad hocness or the realm of of uh, 
of conventional stratagem to save your theory. So like Hogwarts would admit it's normal, right? So yeah, I guess. Uh, Popper used the term normative. He probably does. The term normative is already kind of popular at this time. Um, but more often you say it's practical, I think. But anyway, um, right. So, but getting back to this, right? So, Putnam says, you know, um, the way scientists behave was not to treat this anomaly as a potential falsifier of the theory at all. Rather, they treat it as a puzzle to be solved using the theory. And again, right, this is important, they were right. This was the right thing to do. Because Neptune was there, right? <laughs> so, um, so, Um, so this is Popper's response. Actually, maybe he's not, maybe he's saying, see, now I feel like Lakatos. <laughs> maybe Popper is really Popper one and I was channeling Popper two. But anyway, this is what he says. Of course, we often need as well idealizing assumptions, auxiliary hypotheses, for some sophisticated tests of a highly informative theory, right? So, so at this point, he's, he is taking on this, like after having first just dismissed Putnam because like Putnam didn't notice that I never said a, a theory by itself implies observations. He is actually taking on the question of what about these idealizing assumptions that are not initial conditions. So he says, of course, we often need as well idealizing assumptions, auxiliary hypotheses for some sophisticated tests of a highly informative theory. But some tests are quite crude. If the force of gravity were to become a repulsive force, Putnam would soon notice the difference. <laughs> right? So, I mean, I, I'm not sure exactly what it means if the force of gravity became a repulsive force. It wouldn't be the force of gravity if it were a repulsive force, but I, I mean, I, okay, I guess I kind of understand this, but it would be the force of levity. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so um, yeah, if the planet suddenly started behaving, well, but actually, this is important. Anyway, I'll read to the end of the quote. Uh, if the force of gravity were to become a repulsive force, Putnam would soon notice the difference. Indeed, he considers this sort of possibility himself, saying in his section nine, Newtonian physics would probably have been abandoned if the world had started to act in a more remarkably non-Newtonian way. I cannot see what auxiliary assumptions would be needed in such unambiguous cases. Well, um, so in section nine, Putnam is distancing himself from Kuhn, saying that, it's not really true that, that, that without another paradigm on the table, we would never give up the old thing. So like if Newtonian, if the world behaved in a markedly non-Newtonian way, we probably would have like just said, well, we don't know what's going on, but Newtonian mechanics really doesn't work. <laughs> so, um, So, like, Popper takes that as a kind of inconsistency on Putnam's part. But I think for Putnam, it's all part of the same point that um, um, there's no clean cut logical rule that you're following. It's not the rule that the theory is, is, is completely immune to falsification, no matter what, no matter what happens. But it's certainly also not the, 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 the rule that the theory will be falsified when we find a falsifying hypothesis. Rather, most of the time scientists are doing this, but if this really stopped working very well or it never worked very well to begin with, then they would stop even if they didn't have an alternative on the table. If it was bad enough. So, I mean, um, so for Pandem, I think this isn't really a serious issue. For Popper, however, if we come back to that example of 
the force of gravity becoming repulsive. So, I mean, what auxiliary hypothesis would you need or auxiliary statement would you need to explain that? There's another force that's really strong <laughs> that suddenly started acting, we don't know why, and it's pushing everything apart. And it's not gravity, it's a different force, right? And if you make it strong enough, you could make it reverse gravity, right? So, um, I mean, uh, that is something you could put in here and still get the observations. So I think that's why I wanted to make Popper say something Again, feeling a lot of frustration here. I wanted to make Popper say something a little more sophisticated. Yes, you can do that if you want, but that's a bad methodological rule. Right? Um, and, and at that point, he could explain why, in this case, it's good, but you no, know, when all you have to do is add another planet. That's good, but when you have to do something like this, like add in this huge repulsive force that suddenly turned on, then uh, um, so you can still say the theory of Newtonian gravitation is completely true, but at that point you shouldn't you shouldn't do that. Um, and you know, like I think Popper can even explain this based on his methodological rules that he gives in the logic. He does do this a little bit in his reply. He says, like, you know, actually, it was, first of all, like, almost no observations could be explained by just adding one more planet. It takes a really specific type of perturbation that could be explained that way. Um, in fact, he's like, no observations except a set of measure zero to be explained by this, right? So, um, so, um, and moreover, like the, the prediction that Neptune would be where they said it was going to be at the time they said it was going to be was highly improbable to begin with, right? Like if you would just like without knowing anything about this, it just said, I think there will be a planet there at time so and so. That would be a really um, improbable prediction based on your background knowledge. Right? So I think what, what Popper is getting at here is that this meets his criteria for introducing an ad hoc hypothesis, namely that it makes the theory stronger and less probable. Now, I mean, the problem with that, which I think he still doesn't address here, he didn't address there, is that this is a strict universal, so I don't know how you can add it to your theory. <laughs> but, but anyway, like it, it, it is true that the theory plus this auxiliary statement forbids much more than it used to. Whereas the theory plus this auxiliary statement allows much more than it used to. There's still a gravitation everywhere, but there's also this other force that we don't know when it's going to turn up, right? So now almost any behavior is allowed. So, right, so that's an ad hoc hypothesis to save your theory, whereas this is a good methodological move. So, I mean, oh. I think, and since I'm almost out of time, I'll just, I'll, I'll just, summarize and end with this. I think the situation between Popper and these critics is a little bit of an impasse, right? Like, I think Popper can, like, um, I think they do raise serious issues for Popper, which Popper hasn't addressed completely, and even in his responses doesn't address completely. But I, I think he has the resources to respond to them if you wanted to. So I'm saying that because, um, you know, next time we're reading, reading Kuhn, and in that case, I think it's much less clear that, that Kuhn's attack is, attack is much deeper than these people's attack. And it's much less, less clear what Popper can say in response. Actually, I know what he did say in response, but I won't give that away. <laughs> All right. So on that note, I'll see you next week.